Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 13 of the True Crime All the Time Unsolved podcast. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me, as always, is my partner in true crime, Mike Gibson. Gibby, how are you? Man, I'm doing well. It's good to hear. I'm excited, though. You're always excited for a little Unsolved. I am, but I'm really excited because Unsolved finally, finally has its own Facebook page. Yeah, we do. So... I think a lot of people will know that we started True Crime All the Time first, and then we started the spinoff, True Crime All the Time Unsolved, but we've been operating both of them under the same Facebook page, the same Twitter, and we finally changed that. So we have a new Facebook page called True Crime All the Time Unsolved. I don't know what else we would have called it. Yeah. And we have a new Twitter page. And the handle uh, is at TCAT Unsolved. So for everybody that loves the show, go out to Facebook. You can do a quick search. You'll find our page. Like us, follow us on there. And then look up our new Twitter account for Unsolved and follow us on that as well. So Gibbs, let's talk about uh, what's our topic tonight. Yeah, we're going to talk about, it's actually kind of a sad because we're going to talk about a little girl. That always is. Yep. And we're going to talk about Leticia Hernandez, a seven-year-old out in Oceanside, California, in San Diego County. So it is a sad story, Gibbs. And, you know, most of the stories that we do are because if it's unsolved, that means something bad has happened. Right. And I definitely any time that we're dealing with children, that adds a an even bigger element or a, another layer. Yeah. A more saddening element to it. Mm-hmm. But I, I found some statistics that I, I kind of wanted to run through before we start the actual case. And the first set I got off the, the poly Klaus foundation website. It, and it says that 99.8% of the children who go missing do come home. That's a good number. It's a, I mean, it's, it's a huge number. Yeah. And nearly 90% of missing children have basically either misunderstood directions or they've miscommunicated their plans, they're lost, or they've run away. Only 9% are kidnapped by a family member in a custody dispute, and even lower, 3% are abducted by non-family members, usually during the commission of a crime like a robbery or some type of sexual assault. And very often in that case, the kidnapper is someone that the child knows. Now, only about 100 children a year, and that's just a fraction of a per- less than 1%, are involved in, I guess, what you'd call like a stereotypical stranger abduction. Okay. And those are the, you know, those are really the ones you hear about on the news. And a lot of times those are going to be the ones that we're covering because. In, in the end, something bad happens. But even in those cases, about half of those 100 children a year come home. So, and that's how you get to that 99.8%, right? right? So really what they're saying is about 50 kids a year. Now that's 50 kids a year too many, we know. Right. But in just talking about the statistics, it is very low that, a child would be involved in the situation such as we're about to talk about. And I wonder if the Amber alert system helped reduce that. Yeah. I mean, I clearly it helped reduce it, but I wonder how much with the Amber alert system we have today has really made a reduction in kids being kidnapped. No, I, I think you're onto something because we know it's reduced it. We just don't know by what percentage. percentage. But getting that information out, and we're, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but getting that information out quickly, which is what the Amber Alert is designed to do, is key. So I've got just a little more that I took from a study that was done by the Department of Justice. And it basically says that you know most victims tend to be female, usually just a right around 11 or a little bit older, but they're most victims, they're leading normal lives with normal families, and they describe them as low-risk victims. 
And one fact that I thought was really interesting is that the initial contact between the victim and the perpetrator occurs within a quarter mile of the victim's residence. Most often. Most often, yeah. And that is not very far Mm -mm. at all. Now, when it comes to killers, when we're talking about killers, they say that the average, most of them are around 27 years old, predominantly unmarried, half of them either living alone or with their parents, half are unemployed. So, I mean, you're, you're getting the picture of what most of these killers of young victims are like. Can we say half probably live in the basement of their parents? Home? I would say that's probably safe to say. Okay. And those that are employed tend to be employed in unskilled or semi-skilled occupations. And this is where we get into what you were talking about, the Amber Alert, because more than half of these cases are initially reported to law enforcement as a missing child. It's said that in most of these cases, typically there's like a two hour delay in making that initial report, right? Now, my assumption is that a lot of people don't want to jump to conclusions or jump to the worst scenario and call the police too early. But what they're saying in this is that you can't call too early. Yeah. You've got to call right away because the vast majority of these abducted children, they're they're already murdered within three hours of the abduction. And we learned that when we did the Sandra Cantu case. Yeah, definitely. So if you look at this, if you're waiting two hours to get the word out yeah, and most of the murders occur in three hours, that's a one hour window. Yeah. And that's not enough. No. I mean, three hours is short as it is. So I guess what we're saying is you can never, you can't call too early. All right. So I I just, I don't know. I found those statistics. I thought they were very interesting and I kind of wanted to do those up front. Yeah. And in a strange way, a very strange way, I feel better knowing that information But it's still sad that, like you said, 50 are still missing. Yeah. And again, you and I do a podcast talking about bad things happening to good people. Right. And I think a lot of people, you know, if you watch the nightly news, which I don't because it's depressing as hell. Yeah, I agree. But if you just watch that, you would think that things are going down at an unbelievable rate, right? So I I do think some of these statistics are good, even though, like we said, 50 kids being killed, that's way too many. It should be zero, Mm -hmm. but we don't live in that world. Mm -mm. But the fact that of all missing kids, 99.8% come home, you're right. It, It makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's not what we talk about. No. We talk about the, the point two percent, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Right. So you mentioned it gives Letitia Hernandez, you know, by all accounts, she was just a bubbly seven-year-old. She was described by family as as timid. Yeah. And mothering. I I really, you know, I took a lot away from that because here here's here's a seven-year-old who her own mother said was a mothering type. Like she took care of other people at seven years old. Yeah. And she had younger brothers. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're going to go through, she had a big family. She did. She had five siblings in total when she disappeared. She had only one sister that, and she was older. Maris was 16 years old. And then she had brothers. Alejandro was 12. Victor was 10. Uh, Daniel was four, and then her little baby brother, Jorge, was only two years old. So, you know, by all accounts, appears to be just a big, happy family. You know, she had her mom and dad were together. Her dad was named Rodolfo. He was a farm worker in Sacramento. Now, her mom was also named Leticia. Yep. And then she had a grandmother named Victoria. So at the at the time that all of this occurred, there was it was said that maybe as they had as many as twelve people 
relatives and living in this apartment. Yeah, even her uncle Jesus was living there. Yeah. So yeah. So so it was a big family. So we're talking about December sixteenth of nineteen eighty nine, and this is only two days after I know Letitia's seventh birthday. Yeah. And she's playing out in the front yard of their apartment building. It's around five PM. Yep. And at that time her mother had gone to a nearby laundry room. And so Letitia was playing and her brother, her youngest brother, Jorge, yeah. it was said that he was with her. Yeah, they were playing out in the front front yard, front steps. Now, her mother returned about 10 minutes later mm-hmm. and Letitia was gone. They called the police. And by all accounts, the initial focus was on a man that was driving a late model black Cadillac that had been seen in the neighborhood. And it was reported Gibbs that he had been offering kids $50 to get into his car. Isn't that weird? I mean, this is, well, that's gotta be suspect number one. Yeah. You would think because anybody that is offering children $50 to get into his car has not a single good intention. No. And, I'm sorry, but 50 bucks back in 1989, that's a lot of money. Well, and we have to talk about the neighborhood, right? I mean, this was not a a wealthy area that they lived in by any means. Mm -mm. So somebody driving around just handing out $50, that's... That's, yeah. That says something. something. Now, if you take that a step further, though, if a person has bad intentions... They're getting that fifty dollars back. Yeah, right. I right. Mean, I don't want to be too macabre about right. it, but you could offer a hundred dollars. You Does, could offer doesn't matter two hundred dollars. You're going to put it back in your pocket. Yeah, if, if if you're doing it to do a bad thing to somebody, chances are you're getting whatever you offered up back. So let's talk a little bit about the search because that you know that happens pretty quickly. I think it was said that they they brought in the Marine Corps. And they were searching a canyon near Interstate 5. Now, the, the neighborhood that that they lived in, I guess, was butted up against the Interstate 5. So that was the reason, I assume, for thinking, first, we need to search this canyon. Sure. But they also searched a nearby river. But again, and we this happens a lot with the unsolved, right? They do all this searching... And it turns up nothing. Turns up nothing. Now, the one thing I want to stress about this case is it it did receive a lot of television exposure. There was a segment on Crime Stoppers. It was featured on Unsolved Mysteries at one point and even America's Most Wanted. So the other thing was is that there really was an outpouring of sympathy from the community they they held benefits, they raised at least $10,000 in reward money, and at one point, I mean, the police department even wrote a song about yeah. Letitia. Yeah, they did. That they used to, to help raise funds as well. So, I, I guess what I'm saying is, there was a lot of people that came to either look for her or to lend support. The police were definitely involved. We talked about this on some of our other cases where when it's a non-Caucasian person, girl in particular, that goes missing, right? There's been, there's a lot of talk of that the police don't put the same level of effort into finding that person. And and we're we're dealing with that right now, right? With the the, DC, with the DC, the 19 girls, right? You're hearing a lot of that right now about nobody cares. They're not looking for, and that may be the case. I don't, I haven't researched that case, but that's the point I'm making here is that, you know, obviously we didn't say it, but Letitia's Hispanic. Right. And there's a tremendous amount of outpouring for her. Oh, they even form a uh, group called the San Diegans for the return of Letitia Hernandez. Uh, and it had like Gene Altry as the board member. I mean, that's pretty big. Yeah, back then. Back man. then, yeah, big name. Yeah. So they even have California Angels players on the committee. They have Hall of Famer outfielder Duke Snyder. 
He was yeah. He played for the Dodgers. Oh, did he really? Yeah, Los Angeles Dodgers. Okay, and they also have um, Raleigh Fingers is part of this group. Yep. Who I, I he was big in Oakland, but I think yeah he started in San Diego. And then he so that that would make some so sense. the Padres. Yeah, yeah, he played for the Padres. Yeah, so he's part of this, and they're and, and they're doing these benefits like you said, Mike, and they're trying to um, raise a hundred thousand dollars, which would be like a million dollars today, right? I mean, it's a lot of money. I don't know. You on on different episodes, your your money conversion from year <laughs> to year is it's, suspect, but we'll go with it. It's been exact. People were like, <laughs> "Man, he's like Rain Man." No, I don't think so. But anyway, I mean, it, it would be a lot of money. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the police ultimately get more than you know twenty six hundred tips pouring in. They get a lot of tips on Letitia's disappearance. Well, I'm thinking that Crime Stoppers and probably the bigger one was with the Unsolved Mysteries. That was pretty big back in the day. Well, and so was America's Most Wanted. That's I used true too. I used to watch America's Most Wanted all the time because that was John Walsh and and again he was big on these kind of cases. And we're going to talk about we're going to tie that in in a minute because obviously his son Adam was abducted. So he's like the forefront, really. Yeah, he of yeah. the media world of, of this kind of stuff. I would say, yeah. Between, National media. Between that and Unsolved Mysteries, those were probably the two big, big ones. Crime Stoppers, I, my theory is that was local. Yeah. Right? Crime Stoppers is, is more of a local thing. Right. So one thing we have to talk about is, you know, obviously this happened on December 16th. Not that long before Christmas. And... The family is just heartbroken to the point where, you know, they they have gifts. Mm-hmm. They had already purchased gifts for Letitia, and these would remain wrapped, ready for her to return. I mean, that's I mean, that's sad when you think yeah, about it. Yeah, it does make you sad. I mean, they even talk about a scooter that they had with a bow on it that was by the tree. And then one other thing that I really felt there was another thing that I found really heartwarming, and that was something that the classmates at her elementary school did, and it was basically said that every day the students would rotate the desks that they sat in to ensure that Letitia's desk was never empty. So there would be an empty desk, obviously, right? but they made sure that hers was never empty. It was never the one that was empty. And I really found that heartwarming because you're talking about what first, second graders. Yeah. I think they, they said she was in second grade Yeah, at yeah. seven years old. At the same time, Mike Letitia was listed as the nation's number one child abduction case by the national center for missing and exploited children. So I think that probably helped out a little bit too with getting it out. I would say so because that's, that's a big organization. Yeah. And I think that happened fairly quickly, right? We're not talking years down the road. No, no, it happened. It happened like a month later in January of, uh, uh so a month later of 90, uh, 90. Right. Yes. So yeah, I, I imagine that was huge in getting her awareness out. Yeah. And around the same time, there was a plastic cup manufacturer in San Diego that put her picture on it. And they shipped these to, because at the same time, you know, she was just an all mentioned on these different crime stoppers and uh, unsolved mysteries and all that. Right. Right. So they started getting, like you mentioned, thousands of tips. Well, a lot of these tips that were coming in and we're talking about them here in a little bit were in Florida. So this San Diego cup manufacturer put her face on these cups and they shipped them out to Florida to be, used in a bunch of concession stands and different arenas and different uh, baseball events and things like that. So that was one way they were trying to get her case out there. So what another company did was they took Letitia's photograph and they sent it to over 80 million homes across the country by putting her face on grocery bags, which was, I mean, what a great idea. Right. I mean, so I guess it's, I don't even remember Mike when the, Milk cartons came out. That's what I was just thinking. I I think they were probably around back then, but 
I'm sure she was probably on milk cartons as well. She but, might have been, yeah. But this just furthers our point, right? There is a lot of people stepping up and people spending their own money yeah. to really help out here. And I, I mean, that says something it, about the community. It says something yeah. about the people that own these businesses. Now, it's also, again, and you said we're going to talk about Florida. I also wonder how much of that led to, and maybe you can never have too many tips. Yeah. But some of these tips that were coming in were coming from pretty far away places. I, I just wonder if it led to some erroneous I think it probably did. information as well. But I, I mean, think you have to take the go the good with the bad. I mean, we talk about rabbit holes, but man, could you imagine? I mean, because you have to take every tip that comes in and seriously enough to look at it. Well, if you have to vet it out. Yeah. And again, if you're in, in California and tips are pouring in from Florida, those are much harder to, to vet out. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you could show me a picture of somebody right now, and for me to see that, to say that I saw that person at the mall, I, it might have looked like that person, but to say that was that person for sure, I don't know how these people do that. I don't either, because my memory, I don't I don't have a photographic memory. And I not, don't either. Not many people do. No. Well, I think at this point, you know, we got to talk about there were a number of other cases that happened in and around the same area as Letitia. One happened, you know, before her disappearance and then two after her. Right. So I'll talk about the one that happened before. So on August 5th, 1988, Charity Karens, she again was seven years old as well. She was reported missing by her mother because she failed to come home from a visit to a friend's house in Pacific beach. Now, 10 months later, some hikers that were walking through a Canyon in Riverside County, they found a, a small skull, which included a lower jaw and nine teeth. And this would ultimately be determined to be charities. Now this is another one. Gibbs, her killer has never been identified. All right, so Gibbs, June 19th, 1991, Laura Arroyo, she's nine years old. She lives in Chula Vista. She was just answering the door of her house and disappeared. Wow. So whoever was at that door took her. The very next day, two women found her body about three miles away from her home. Hmm. She'd been beaten and stabbed. Now, they put somebody away for her murder, a guy named Manuel Bracamontes. And he got the death penalty in 2005 for the kidnapping, molestation, and murder of Laura. But again, her murder drew national attention because a lot of people, weeks after she died, they were claiming to have seen her face on a, on a blank billboard which is, I mean, this part is very strange. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I don't know why they were, this is a, a, like, I'm thinking like a white billboard before they put up yeah. the actual ad. And tons of people came forward and just were saying that they saw her face. It's almost kind of like that religious kind of thing when they someone says they see a statue crying, you know, like they see the tear of... Or a potato chip that looks like... Or a potato chip that looks like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, thousands of people, yeah. thousands, yeah. went to this intersection just to look at this billboard. That's amazing. So there, it was something that. to yeah, it. I, absolutely. I don't, it could have been a water stain. It could have been whatever. But to say that it looked just like her, that's amazing. Yeah. Th there was definitely something to it. Well, that same year, Mike, just a month later in July of 91, Rashida Wilson, she was nine years old. She told her mother that she was just going to go outside and play for a little bit. She was playing outside at the Yale Hotel when she disappeared. So the police searched the area. They passed out flyers. They were actually broadcasting her name from the helicopter, and the uh, searchers just checked every alley, the dumpsters, uh, the vacant buildings. Um, however, Rashida was never found to this date. So I don't... So the reason we bring these up, Gibbs, is because they're all so similar. To Letitia. They are. 
age wise. Now they, the middle one we talked about, they put somebody away, but they didn't catch him until much later, right? He wasn't sentenced till 2005. Exactly. So could this guy have been involved in all four? Could have been, you know, somebody that did two of them or three of them. Exactly. He could have been somehow tied into more than just the one that he got in trouble. Oh, for. I don't, I think there's no doubt about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I do too, but they're just so similar and they're all, you know, within, I don't know what the radius is, but they're all within an, a, the area where Letitia. Yeah. They're all in that San Diego, San Diego County. Yeah. So, so that's, that's why we bring those up because Again, I think that Manuel Bracamontes is interesting. Mm-hmm. I would I would assume they would have looked at him after he was caught for some of these others. But if they had no way to tie him in, right? right? No DNA or no fingerprint. So, all right. So let's get back to Letitia, and I think what we want to do is talk about some suspects, right? Get into suspects, okay? Because some witnesses come forward right you know after she disappears and basically what they're describing to police is a tall white man in his mid 30s maybe early 40s about 6 foot tall pretty big guy 230 250 pounds yeah with blonde shoulder length hair that was thinning on top and Probably more the most specific thing is he had a tattoo of a cross with some kind of writing on it on the back of one of his hands. So that's pretty specific. That is. And again, the witness is saying that they saw Letitia get in a vehicle and be taken away by these people. People, yeah. So, I mean, that's very important. Now, there was another person described with them, and this was a woman. It was just she was described as a skinny, slender, white woman, approximately thirty years old, five six to five eleven, which that's kind of a that's pretty big range. Yeah, plus five eleven, that's pretty tall. It is tall. But anyway, that's that's what the description was. She had blonde hair and you know light complexion, but then there was a third one, third suspect too, another white woman. Now, this woman had what was described as a very deep tan, and she was a little older, late 40s, maybe early 50s, described as heavy set with dark brown hair with gray streaks running through it. Right. So we've got some pretty good descriptions. The problem is, and so they make composites, right, out of these descriptions. And it wasn't just one person, and I think that's important. Right. There was a number of people that came forward and gave descriptions of these three people. Yes. Multiple. Yeah. So I I think that's very important to to point out. You just don't have one person that says, I saw this. You have a number of people that saw this. Now there's, there's one problem with composites. Sometimes they're pretty accurate and sometimes they're not very accurate at all. It really depends on how well, or how good the person or people describing the the suspects to the artist and the artist's interpretation. Interpret, yeah. I'd be terrible at that. Well, I can't draw for... No, no. I mean, I'd be terrible at... If, if I saw... If I was a witness to a crime, I would be really bad at saying how tall someone was, how much they weighed, or, or, or even trying to... I mean, I sit across from you too many times. Well, that's what I'm saying. But I, there's no way that I could tell a police artist... On what you look like. I, I literally, I'm looking at you across the studio yeah. desk, and I could not. I don't even know how I would describe you to somebody and say, "This is what your nose looks like." Yeah, this is what same here. I I just don't, I don't even know, know how. what color your eyes are. Right, I, I don't know, and you shouldn't. I, you should not know. <laughs> that would mean you're way too close to me. Exactly. Mine are blue, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, we've got these composite drawings. Yes. I assume Gibbs that they're copied and sent out to different agencies and, and all of that. All right, Gibbs, let's get into confirmed sightings of Letitia. Cause there were quite a number of them. And you know, this every time one would come in, it would give 
the family a lot of hope. Oh, I bet. And so the first one actually occurred the night she went missing. And this was basically a man was sighted with a child at the Buckman Springs rest stop in East San Diego County that very night, December 16th. The second sighting was of a man, woman, and a child at the San Simon rest stop. And this was on Interstate 10 near the Arizona-New Mexico border. Okay. But this occurred later on, December 27th. So about 11 days later. So yep, making some easy time. Yeah, took taking a long time if you're getting from San Diego to the Arizona-New Mexico border. Right. The third sighting was also on Interstate 10, and this one was described as a, a woman and a little girl at a rest stop in Texas, just east of El Paso. So within, you know, uh, let's say a month, you've got three sightings that would match the descriptions that they have, mm -hmm. all involving a little girl. So again, every time the family hears this, right, they got to be hopeful. Oh, absolutely. But then they also have to be, what's the word? Well, uh, they have to be optimistic for sure. Yeah, but also nerve. I don't want to say nervous, but I mean anxious, anxious because you don't know what's gonna what's happening next, right? And, and and also, are you thinking my child is getting further away from me? Absolutely, you are. Right. So we're going from San Diego to Arizona slash New Mexico. Now we're in Texas. I mean, now they're just further east away, and you're just wondering how are we gonna stop stop this? this? Yeah, yeah, and that's how, what I'm thinking. Where are these people headed? So on January 2nd, there is a sighting in Panama City, Florida. January 5th, there's another sighting in Brantford, Florida. And I'm not really sure where Brantford, Florida is. I don't either. I know where Panama City, because yeah. I used to go there for spring break. Yeah, me, me too. Yeah. And then in between, so January 1st and 10th, there's several sightings in Chattahoochee. I don't know where Chattahoochee is, but I like the name. I do. So... But again, Chattahoochee, Florida, there's multiple sightings allegedly of her in that area. Yeah. Now, again, is uh, is this coming from what you talked about earlier, where that one company had sent all the cups to Florida? Yeah. Along with the picture on the grocery bags that happened to go out to the San Diego area. But they also sent those to Florida as well. Oh, OK. Yeah. So I, I guess what I'm getting at is you, you just wonder are they really seeing Letitia or are they just seeing all these cups and these bags and they're saying, Oh, there's a man, a woman yeah. and a child or, or a woman and a child kind of looks like her, you know, the child maybe his is Hispanic and I'm going to call in and say, right. You just don't know. No. And that's where we, you know, like you said, you know, being on all the different shows that she was on and, and to the point on February 4th, of 90 America's most wanted. They air a second segment on the case, which generates even more leads. Right. Which again, like you said, I couldn't tell you if I saw Letitia, but so I don't know how all these other folks are, you know, seeing a car drive by and saying, that's that little girl. Well, you know, I think there's a need for people to want to help. And again, we talk about all this exposure. You can't have too much exposure in a situation like this. No, I think you're right. You'd rather have more of this than less of it for right. sure. But it's going to lead to a lot of tips and people calling in. Yeah. But, I, you know, as a father, I would rather have more tips. Like, you know, we know that. And, no and doubt. Allow, allow the experts to do what they do best and track them down. And just let the police do what they do best and see if there's any truth behind it. So this takes us up to March. So in, between March 11th and March 23rd, again, there's multiple sightings in the city of Quincy. On March 26th in Greensboro, Florida, there's another sighting. March 31st, there's a sighting in the city of Marion, and then another sighting in Cottondale. So, Gibby, you're doing all the Florida sightings. Right. And there were some other sightings that I have, but I don't have exact dates on them, but there was a really interesting one where a police officer 
in a small town about 70 miles southeast of Dallas reported a couple. Now, you got a police officer. Yeah, trained. Now, yeah, is reporting a couple that matched the description of the kidnappers. And it was said that they were driving a maroon car. Unfortunately, the police officer didn't stop these people because it wasn't until a few hours later that he saw the first notice on the kidnapping. Oh, wow. So it he, he didn't think about it until obviously it was too late. They were gone. And then I kind of go back, Mike, to the day of where some of the kids were talking about the black Cadillac. You know, could could you mistake, as a kid, could you have mistaken a black car for a maroon car, you know? Oh, so I could probably do that today. Yeah. With some of the weird paint so when schemes. you when you said maroon car i'm thinking man i wonder if that really was them then well the one thing about this one was there's a lot of doubt about the validity because the officer he only saw the couple he only says that the couple matched the description he never actually saw a child uh, what he says is that he saw the woman reaching into the back seat but he never actually saw... Now, granted, a seven-year-old, you probably wouldn't be able to see. No. It's not going to stick up over the... Especially the cars back then, yeah. too. But, you know, for what it's worth, I thought that was an interesting one because if it was true, mm-hmm. he was close and could have pulled them over if he had seen that notice just a few hours earlier. Yeah. So now I have to talk about probably the strangest one. And this tip comes from Tijuana and a man called a local television station in Tijuana on New Year's Eve. And he asked for Letitia's parents' phone number. The guy called twice and he gave his name as Roberto Ramirez. And he told the information director at the, for the news division there at the channel that he actually had Letitia. They refused to give out any information. They weren't going to give him the parent's phone number, obviously. But the guy called back again and said he had more information about Letitia. This time, they gave him the number of the Oceanside police, and the guy hung up. So it's an interesting story, Mm -hmm. but there wasn't anything that they could really do with that. because, And it was said that Roberto Ramirez... They use that down in Mexico, almost like we use John Doe up here. Okay. So, and I don't know exactly what that means, but I don't know if that's a a name that they use. Just so common that they could just interchange it, use it, and that way no one one could be tracked back. Or if if they literally use it like we use John Doe, it would mean they use it for an unidentified body. Body, right. If that's what they really mean by that. Interesting. But again, I, I just thought it was, it's an interesting story, but like a lot of the stories and rabbit holes we go down, right? it, it led nowhere. So this leads us back to Florida again, because more tips are coming in. And now, allegedly, she spotted on April 30th in Brantford, and then again on May 5th in Wado, Florida. And then the last sighting is in High Springs, and that's May 22nd, 1990. And really, after that, Gibbs, there are no more reported sightings. No. And actually, on that sighting, it's one of the few that she was actually said she was spotted with a white man and a white woman. Which would match match everything that's been told up to that date. Right. Of course, there's a lot of white men and a lot of white women, so. Yeah. With children running around. But obviously, that's why you're getting so many tips. Yeah. Right. Not all of those could have been Letitia, I'm sure. But could some of them have been? Could have been. Definitely. I don't know. But ultimately, there would be, what, 18, 20 different reported sightings, probably. Yeah. Stretching all the way from California to Florida and all along the way. All right, Gibbs. So before we go any further, I've got to talk about this story. And it basically involves a local paper and hiring a New York psychic to help in the search for Letitia. Oh, I like when psychics get involved. Yeah. So the psychic's name was John Monty. Okay. And he actually visited with 
Letitia's family, spent maybe an hour with them. And of course they had a reporter because they're paying for it. Mm -hmm. The newspaper is. And so the psychic looked at Letitia's picture, asked him some questions. And I think Letitia's mom was kind of leery about the whole thing from the beginning. But the one thing about this psychic and, and you and I have talked about psychics on other episodes and you know, a lot of people will just laugh at the thought of a psychic. But this guy was actually credited with finding a three-year-old boy in Maine. Oh, wow. Who was kidnapped all the way in Calif- from California. And he was able to lead the Massachusetts police to a murder suspect and help clear that murder. I mean, that's, that's what was said that's about impressive. him. That's so impressive. So I don't know how much he helped, but he's, he's credited with that. Now, the police weren't into it at all. I mean, they actually came out and said that, you know, this guy has not met with any police investigators. He's not involved with us in any way. This is completely an independent thing that's being done by the newspaper. So I think they were kind of shutting it down or, you know, discrediting the use of a psychic. But, but you and I, I think, have talked before. Again, I don't know if I believe in any of that, but if I was in that situation, I don't think there was anything I wouldn't try. Yeah, same here. I mean, I want my kid back. Right. So, Gibbs, we have to talk about one suspect in particular, and this was a convicted child molester that lived just basically a block away from where Letitia lived, and... He, he would become probably the most viable suspect mm-hmm. in the case. And the police looked really hard at this guy. You know, he was 40 years old. He was a landscaper, married, had three children. I mean, it got as far as, ac- you know, actually having a federal grand jury investigate him. But it never got past that point. So obviously they didn't have enough evidence. He was never arrested. But by all accounts, he was probably the most viable suspect. I think we'd have to say that. Yeah. All right. So this takes us up to early March of 91. And this is where a property caretaker discovers Letitia's skull. So this is when she's found. And he finds it near this rural county road. And it was said, Gibbs, that this was a road that was favored by smugglers yeah like people smugglers right oh yeah from mexico into the united states very kind of remote area between an indian reservation and the riverside county line yeah so it was said that that area was basically a dumping ground for sex workers and the human trafficking victims that they would find bodies out there all the time I can I I would have to imagine that they found a lot of bodies from people that were being smuggled into the country as well. Oh yeah. I mean because from what I understand and again my knowledge is pretty limited, but I think you we've seen over the years that people go to great lengths to try to, you know, try to get into the United States and sometimes they they die you know, in, in, in the process of trying to do that. Right. Yeah. Whether it's because they're hidden in a trunk and have run out of air or have limited dehydration. air, dehydration. So yeah, I, I can imagine that there's areas like this part they're talking about where they're finding a lot of bodies from all kinds of different reasons. Now near the body officers, obviously, get called to the scene and they find a pair of red shorts that the family confirms Letitia had been wearing on the day that she was abducted. And ultimately they do positively identify the skull as belonging to Letitia. And they do that through dental records. Now keep in mind that, and we got to talk about this, this area where they find her remains is only about 20 miles from her house. That's pretty close. So what we, (laughs) we got to go back now and kind of talk about some of the sightings because 
the medical examiner would come out and say that she likely died within two or three months of being abducted. Yeah. So what does that mean? Does that mean that she was taken from California and taken, you know, those sightings that we talked about in Arizona and Texas, and then all those ones in Florida, was she taken all the way to Florida and then somehow brought all the way back yeah, and, and then killed. killed? Doesn't make sense. Or the other explanation is, is that she was kept for a period of time mm-hmm. somewhere in and around the area where she lived by somebody local. Yeah. And all of those sightings were just people that thought they saw somebody that looked like Letitia, but it really wasn't. Her. Really wasn't. Yeah. I think really when it, when you boil it down, those are your two options. It makes me want to lean harder on the landscaper that lived a block away. I would agree. So I, I would agree. I think it's more likely that she was abducted and kept for some period of time by somebody local to the area, somebody that probably was familiar with this road and knew that this was probably the per- perfect place to dump a body. Sure. Now, what we don't know is what happened to Letitia during this two or three month period. Yeah. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Yeah. Because whatever it was, it couldn't have been good. No. So you're right. I don't think I want to know, and I don't want to dwell on or even talk about what it could have been. But I I do think one of the things that comes out of this is authorities, they they say they won't discount those out-of-state sightings. So I think you and I are saying it's more likely that she never left the state. Authorities... They may be leaning that way as well, but they're not discounting the fact that she could have been taken yeah. out and brought back. But I just, I don't see why. I, I, I if, just, if I was in the shoes of the people that took her, I wouldn't put myself at, at additional risk of traveling all the way back through another five, seven states to bring her back to California if I was already in Florida. Yeah. Wh- why not just kill her in Florida? Yeah. And, and dispose of the body there, I right. guess. Yeah, why, why come all the way back? I don't... I don't. Yeah. yeah. I'm with you on that. I think it's it's more likely that it's the, uh, the first one that we talked about where she was in California the whole time and, and being kept, mm-hmm. you know, against her will. So eventually the Oceanside Police Department, they suspend their investigation. And this is something I want to talk about because... They do it really about two and a half years after her death. You and I have done a number of these episodes yeah. where investigators are 20, 25, 30 years on mm-hmm. cold case units. And I'm not getting that from this. I mean, basically what they're saying is that all the leads have run dry They've got nothing else to work and the K they put all the case files in boxes and they file it in the records department. I mean, I think the the direct quote that I have is everyone pretty much is in agreement that we have run as far as we can at this point. Our department doesn't have any more leads that we feel are worth moving on and spending more time on. I don't know if I, I just don't like the fact that they come out and say that. Right. Because what are you saying to the family? We're not pursuing, we're not, we're not chasing down justice any further. Right. In other cases, you know, they've assigned one person and maybe that person is only able to work the case for so many hours, one day a week, but at least they haven't given up on it. Right. And I think in those cases, you and I have felt really good about that. Yeah. Because I think if we were in that position, that's what we want, would want to happen. Yeah, what I, I wouldn't want is for the police basically two years later to say, you know, we've done all we can. We're boxing all these files up and we're giving up. I guess this two years seems really fast. Yeah, it does to me. So 10 years, I can understand better. Two years, really fast. And, and even then it was said that 
they only had one investigator working part time anyway on it Mm -hmm. before they closed it down. So, you know, I, I don't know. At one point they do have some DNA testing done. That's inconclusive. I mean, that's, this is before they shut it down. It, it might have been part of the reason why they did shut it down. So we're talking about the Oceanside Police kind of shutting it down. There were a number of other agencies that, you know, had worked this case over the year, the couple of years. Right. They didn't officially sit, come out and say they were shutting it down. But I think there were some comments made that, again, the wells run dry. They don't have any leads. Uh they weren't really characterizing it as an active ongoing investigation, but they didn't come out and say, you know, we're boxing everything up. We're shutting it down. And I think that's the part I have the biggest problem with. Yeah. You know, one thing that's kind of tough in this one is Letitia's mom, Letitia, right? She ends up dying in 1998. So, you know, she went to her grave Never knowing, you know, who killed her daughter. No. And, you know, obviously she would have never been the same. I just don't think anybody that would ever be put in that position would ever be the same. No. You know, there wouldn't be a day that went by that you weren't thinking about your son or daughter and wondering where they were. And then even after Letitia is found every day would be about who did this to my son or daughter. Yeah. And I would be wondering what did they do to my son or daughter? Why they had them. Yeah. That's me. The part that you and I don't want to think about. Yeah, But I would, I would be thinking about that. Probably having to think about that. Yeah. And I would hate, I would hate that. I mean, there is a positive thing that comes out of this, you know, because of the terrible thing that happened to Letitia, they do start kinder vision in the state of California in her name. And Kinder Vision is at the school they teach the kids about stranger danger and they educate them on what not to do, right? Don't go up to the car off that's offering you 50 bucks right? or the, the candy, the guy offering you candy, right? I mean, they, they go through all the scenarios on how not to answer the door. And so I think that's a good thing that comes out of it. It is, but I am kind of surprised because I thought Stranger Danger was a much older thing, but apparently, and maybe Stranger Danger in and of itself is an older term. It might be. Because I thought that was around when you and I were little. Yeah. But maybe it's just that they started this actual program program yeah to to teach it. It, and it, it could have been a you know, kinder vision, not having all the details, but... Around that time, you know, I do remember in a lot of the school systems that this is when they would also take your um, uh, kid's picture, right? So if your kid did end up being taken, you had a current picture to show the police. So they would come in. (laughs) It's like any excuse for you to say picture. Picture? Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, Uh, you said it three times. Picture, yeah. Yeah. So they would come in. They would come into the school and take the kid's picture and fingerprint, right? Yeah, and they actually did that with with my kids. Yeah, and they, t- today they still do that. I think they do it more electronically, you know. Yeah. But back in the day, that's and I think that's all this came about because of this. So I mean, if there's any positive thing that happened, I guess there was more greater awareness of the dangers out there and how to be careful. Well, and I think in a situation like that, like this one. That's all you can do, right? Is look for the positive. What what can come out of this? Because it's a horrible act. It's tragic, yeah. What what good can come out of this for other people? That that's the only thing that can happen. So there is one other case that I want to talk about kind of before we we wrap up and it's the case of Amber Dubois and her remains were found along a remote road near that same Indian reservation. Yeah. And it really brought back a lot of very painful memories because it happened 19 years later. Yeah. But it was so similar to the Letitia Hernandez case, you know, the way that the 
remains were discovered, where mm-hmm. they were discovered. It was the same canyon. Yeah, basically just on the other side of the road yeah. where she was found. Yeah, but I mean, that was really the only connection between Letitia's case and Amber's case. Like you said, Letitia was found on, I think, the east side of the road. Amber was found on the west side of the road, but both roughly about two miles south of Riverside County line. Right. So Gibbs, I mean, really all we have left is to talk about Letitia's memorial service. Yep. And that was held on March 23rd, 1991. About 450 people attended to see her laid to rest. So Gibbs, you and I have talked about this before, right? These are tough stories. Yes, very tough. They're hard to research. They're hard to tell, but they're important. We're talking about Letitia's memory. Right. I think anytime we do stories about young children, they're extra tough. I mean, that's there's just no way around it. Yeah, and, and, and not just because we're parents, right? I mean, it, any even if we weren't parents, right? If I have, If I've never had kids... It'd be tough for me to do this, but the fact that I do have kids, it brings it home even harder. I, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah. You and I both have two and, and it, it just hits harder, I think. Yeah. But to your point, it should hit hard regardless. Absolutely. And it would. Yeah. Just saying it hits a little harder for, I think both of us because we do have kids of our own. Right. But you know, that's the story the tragic story and case of Letitia Hernandez. Yeah. So we'll go out on that. Another episode of true crime all the time unsolved. So for Mike and Gibby stay safe and keep your own time ticking.